What would you have seen in London of the year 500 AD? We have already analyzed in detail how Rome transformed from the most splendorous city of antiquity to a field of ruins and now we'd like to imagine how it must have felt to be in London some decades after the Romans had abandoned Britain. What would it have been like to live in those dark times in the largest city of Britannia? The Roman province of Britannia was established shortly after the Emperor Claudius had ordered the invasion of the island in 43 AD. Britain was for the Romans an attractive target because it was rich in precious metals and of course the Romans were always in search of new gold and silver mines and of course slaves. But Britain was also a safe haven for many Gauls who had fled the conquest of Gallia and were now harassing the coasts of Roman Gaul by means of pirate raids. So conquering Britannia made sense from Claudius' perspective. Of course, in hindsight we know that the island would be very problematic for the empire because it would spawn many usurpers throughout its entire Roman history. And these usurpers would cause a lot of damage for the empire. But despite these troubles, Britain remained a Roman province for around 370 years. And in those times many cities were founded by the Romans sometimes on previous Celtic settlements, but sometimes as completely new settlements. Modern archaeological evidence suggests that the latter was the case for Londinium, the city that nowadays is known as London. It appears that this city was founded by the Romans on a previously uninhabited portion of land, as a completely new Roman Civitas. This must have been only a few years after the invasion of Britain began. Some evidence suggests 47 AD as a possible founding year. Over the next century, Londinium grew despite the famous rebellion of Boudicca significantly and reached a peak of possibly up to 60,000 people by the middle of the 2nd century AD and was made the capital of Roman Britain. During its peak, the city had an area of around 2 square kilometers and had all amenities of Roman cities that we know of. Large public baths, an amphitheater, a central forum with large buildings and temples and even a port. A bridge connected the two parts of the city because it had already spread onto the other side of the Thames River, which the Romans called Tamesis. In the 160s AD, the Antonine Plague hit Londinium and the population dropped by possibly up to 60%. And interestingly, the city would never fully recover from this hit. Even later, the city never again reached its peak population, hovering around 30,000 inhabitants from that time onwards. Yet still, in late 2nd century AD, despite this, a wall was built around the city, around 5 kilometers long and up to 6 meters high, a testimony to the still high importance of Londinium. In the following 200 years, Londinium often found itself in the center of barbarian raids or civil wars. Many of the countless usurpers to the Roman throne that came from Britain, such as Claudius Albinus, Carausius, Magnus Maximus or Constantine III, used Londinium as a base for their operations and as point of embarkment to the Gallic shores. Emperor Julian had the walls of Londinium fortified with an additional 22 semicircular towers for defense purposes because in those days barbarian raids by Picts and Gels were already on the rise. Yet still, around 380 AD, Londinium would have still been quite impressive compared to other Roman British settlements and might still have counted 20 to 30,000 inhabitants. Trade was still conducted and large Roman villas from those days are a testimony that despite all the difficulties of those waning days of Roman Britain, there must still have been a considerable amount of wealth present. But then the year 407 AD came and this would mark the beginning of the end for Roman Britain. And please like this video and subscribe so that you won't miss any future videos on the late Roman Empire. And please consider supporting our work on Patreon or via YouTube membership because the long-term sustainability of this channel really depends on your support. YouTube is not really generous to such a niche topic about the late Roman Empire and the ad revenue from the videos is really low. So in order to be long-term sustainable, I really need your financial support via Patreon or YouTube membership. And I would like to thank our new Augustus supporters, Patrick and Jackie Slavin. Thanks so much, Patrick and Jackie, for supporting this channel in such a generous way. 
And of course, I thank each and everyone who is supporting this channel in any form. Gratias Tibiago Amiki. And a big shout out to the excellent new history channel Dialukoi, who provided me with some really excellent animations which I will use from time to time in future videos. Please go and subscribe to their channel, because I think they have a bright future amongst the history channels on YouTube. Thanks Dialokoi for your excellent animations. Already two decades earlier, during the revolt of Magnus Maximus, large portions of the Roman Comitatenses and Limitanei were withdrawn from Britain, which were of course needlessly destroyed in good old Roman manner and never replenished. But then the event came which would set into motion the devastating chain reaction which would cause the dissolution of the Western Roman Empire, namely the crossing of the Rhine on December 31st, 406 AD, about which I talked in detail in this video here. On that and following days, a large coalition of Germanic nations crossed into Gaul and they were able to overrun large parts of Gallia and Hispania. As a consequence, communication from Lundinium with Imperial command in Ravenna largely broke down. The murder of Stilico and the resulting chaos certainly didn't improve the situation. Trade to and from Britain broke down and many soldiers and officers of the remaining Roman army stationed in Britannia did not receive any pay. The devastating situation in Gallia, in combination with the lack of pay, let the Roman troops proclaim a succession of new emperors, but the first two, Marcus and Gratian, did not meet the expectations of the troops and were consequently killed by the enraged soldiers. Their mistake was that they hesitated to set over to mainland Gaul, but not so Constantine III, who was made emperor in 407. He quickly gathered all Roman troops in Britain that he could muster and set over to Gaul later that same year. We must examine the exploits of Constantine III in another video, because he at least initially managed to defend Gaul against the Germanic invaders. However, Britain was left to itself from that point onwards. Already after Magnus Maximus' rebellion, it appears, Londinium, but also other Roman towns in Britain, started to decline. This means that there was an outflow of wealthy families away from the island and some public buildings already started to fall into neglect. But after Constantine III left Britain with almost all Roman troops in 407 and with trade having broken down after the invasions of Gaul and Spain, the cities of Britannia would now enter a steep downward spiral. In the following decades, the leftover garrisons would entrench themselves in the fortified cities or Roman forts in order to defend themselves from the more and more numerous barbarian raids from the Irish, the Picts and the Saxons. Interestingly though, it seems that despite all this, a small number of wealthy Roman families continued to live a Roman lifestyle until about the middle of the 5th century. Archaeological excavations show that a number of villas were inhabited in the southeastern corner of Londinium and the rich Londinians apparently continued importing luxuries. However, then, in the mid-5th century, the Anglo-Saxon invasions began in earnest and the romano brightons fled to their fortified cities, Londinium being one of them. We can imagine leftover Roman troops defending old legionary forts and fortified towns, upholding Roman civilization and the Roman way of life amidst the encroaching barbarism, like small beacons of light amidst the ever-growing darkness. But without trade from the remaining Roman provinces of the West, there was no way to maintain that Roman lifestyle for long. The baths, for example, could not be maintained at some point anymore and started falling into ruin. The old temples by that time had already decayed and were reused for building material. Very few of them were left. All Roman buildings and even churches had started to deteriorate. Some buildings were probably patched together by reusing material from older, collapsed buildings, mostly pagan temples. But despite this, in the later 5th century, Londinium must have already been in a sorry state. With continuing pressure from the Angles, the Saxons, the Utes and the Frisians, many cities were at some point abandoned and the population probably relocated to the last remaining strongholds. 
In 500 AD it appears Londinium had been completely given up and was by that time a largely uninhabited mass of ruins and deteriorating buildings. Maybe someone was still cowering here or there, hiding in some old villa, in some old ruined temple, in some old church. But Londinium was now fully given price to the elements and was decaying ever more quickly. In 500 AD you would have seen a ghost town, with old dilapidated buildings, many old columns and statues overgrown by moss, many of them collapsed and not a soul on the streets or if than only beggars and vagrants searching the old decaying buildings for some leftover valuables. Yet some strongholds were still holding out, probably using leftover Roman equipment and in those days it is thought that the origins of the legend of King Arthur emerged. We must of course talk about who this legendary king might have been or if he even existed, but it indeed could have been a Roman military commander of sorts who rallied the Britons and defeated the Anglo-Saxons on more than one occasion. Possible candidates are Ambrosius Aurelianus or his son or Riotamus. The latter was called upon by Antemius, the Western Roman Emperor, in order to fight against the Visigoths in Gaul, quite fascinatingly, but as I said, we will need an entire video for that topic. But it must have been an utterly fascinating time, a time so utterly devoid of any writings that fact slowly transformed into legend. Britain was plunged into the utter darkness of the Dark Ages when the Romans left. The living standards dropped to pre-Roman levels comparable to the Bronze Age. Technologies from the Roman times completely disappeared. How to make glass became unknown. No new large buildings were built for hundreds of years. People now lived in wooden huts. How to build solid houses of stone was forgotten. The people built their modest dwellings into the Roman ruins of old and started to wonder how impressive these people must have been to be able to build such large structures. And Lundinio, meanwhile, lay empty and abandoned, the Roman ruins further decaying, given price to the elements. The Saxons built a small settlement called Lundenwick but it was outside of Roman Londinium. Only as late as the 9th century, when the Vikings invaded Britain, did King Alfred of the West Saxons move the settlement into Roman Londinium, because the Roman walls were still mostly intact and where they weren't, they were repaired. And thus Londinium had now started its long transformation from a Roman city to the medieval Anglo-Saxon city. And yet, even in those days, in the 9th century, one probably still would have seen many old Roman ruins scattered throughout this newly revived London, reminding the Saxons that once a mighty empire had existed here. And if you are interested in how Rome changed from antiquity to the Renaissance, you can watch this view here in the upper right corner. But if you are more interested in the transformation of Constantinople, you can watch the other video in the lower right corner. I say thanks again to all friends of Roman history. Gratias tibiago amici.